So less boring <laughs> than white adipose tissue, white adipose tissue isn't boring, uh, is brown adipose tissue. So brown adipose tissue, like we mentioned in the last module, is um, a lot less common than white adipose tissue. It's less than about 5% depending on the person. Brown adipose tissue gets its name because it looks darker under a light microscope. It wouldn't look pink, this is the stain that's being used to visualize it, but it looks darker because there's a lot more smaller lipid droplets within the cell and we have a lot more mitochondria as well adding to that darker appearance. Okay? So those the, the higher amount of lipid droplets, that makes it multilocular instead of unilocular, which we see in white adipose tissue. And we do tend to see a lot more brown adipose tissue in areas that are highly innervated and vascular. And like I mentioned, we tend to see a lot more in this upper cervical and clavicular region. Okay, um, develops, so this is interesting, and we'll get back to this later, brown adipose tissue, we believe, develops from muscular progenitors, which explains why it's more metabolically active, and there's so much more mitochondria as well. And like we mentioned in the last section, the main function of BAT is to uh, burn energy for uh, thermogenesis, and specifically adaptive thermogenesis, and we'll get back to that later on. Okay, so this slide gives you an idea of some of the regions where we might see uh, brown adipose tissue. Like I mentioned in the last section, we didn't actually think that adults had BAT. We only really typically saw it in hibernators and neonates, both of which need more thermogenic capacity. Um, neonates need that because they have a lot of surface area. Hibernators need that because they're hibernating. <laughs> but we also see uh, some bat in adults. And not everyone is going to have bat in all of these areas. But I uh, just want to show you these are areas where it has been evidenced. And we find it both um, viscerally and subcutaneously. So here is another slide from a 16-year-old where we see these brown adipocytes. We see that nucleus, which is no longer pushed to the periphery. It's kind of in that cell. And we see a lot of these lipid droplets there as well. We also see in this sample of BAT, we also see um, uh, vasculature as well. So these are going to be blood cells here, and we are going to have a uh, um, some sort of blood vessel there. Also immature uh, brown adipose tissue, if we were to zoom in a little bit more, like I said, we have more of a circular, centrally located nucleus. We also have nice, beautiful mitochondria with really organized cristae in there as well. Um, and again, this is very indicative of brown adipose tissue as opposed to white. One way we can differentiate between immature bat and mature bat is through that organization of the, the mitochondria crista. So you'll notice in immature bat, the uh, mitochondria, those crista are a lot less organized. Um, and that's an indication of immature brown adipose tissue. So yes, brown adipocytes have more lipid droplets, they're multilocular, uh, they have more mitochondria, yes, they have a central nucleus, but actually what makes them the coolest, <laughs> most uh, interesting, is that they overly express something called uncoupling protein 1, UCP1, okay, also known as thermogen. And what makes that so interesting is that this is responsible mainly for the thermogenic activity of brown adipocytes, okay? So what UCP1 does, it is that during uh, the electron transport chain of cellular respiration, UCP1 decouples oxidation and phosphorylation. So typically during the electron transport chain, one of the main end products is the production of a lot of ATP due to the activity of something called ATP synthase, okay? But with UCP1, that production of ATP is lessened because we're uncoupling, like I said, oxidation and phosphorylation. And what happens instead of creating ATP is that a lot of this free energy from cellular respiration is not captured as ATP, and instead there's a net release of heat. And that, again, contributes to the thermogenic activity of this tissue.
So to get a little bit more into the specifics of that, when there is some sort of sympathetic stimulation of our brown adipocytes or beige ones, which we'll talk about later, due to either direct stimulation from the brain or from things like cold exposure, which we'll get to later as well, that is sensed by our beta adrenergic receptors leading to a signal transduction pathway, which we're not gonna cover, that leads to the beginnings of cellular respiration and the uh, eventually to the electron transport chain. That electron transport chain is typically meant, set up, to be able to generate ATP, is to take our, our fuels that are there and to um, oxidate them to eventually produce, uh, to phosphorylate uh, ATP, uh, ADP into ATP, and that's through this ATP synthase. What's happening is when our electron transporters come in to the mitochondrial membrane and there's that series of oxidation and reduction reactions that are happening along the uh, mitochondrial membrane, there is a buildup of protons okay, in that intermembrane space that's creating a force called the proton motive force that typically drives comes back through this ATP synthase complex and typically drives ADP being phosphorylated into ATP, ATP plus an organic phosphate being phosphorylated into ATP. That's what typically happens, okay? But because of uncoupling protein one, which we find in these brown fats, uh, that part is uncoupled, okay? And protons instead flow back okay, to the mitochondrial matrix through this UCP1 complex. And that process, because we're uncoupling oxidation from phosphorylation, okay, what's happening is we're not producing ATP, and instead that buildup is, is leading to a net generation of heat, which again is what makes these, this tissue more um, thermogenic. So I wanted to bring in a more specific study that looks at brown adipose tissue and how we identify it in the body. Okay? So what they actually did is they used um, both uh, PET and CT scans to identify um, brown adipose tissue sites in both men and women. And one of the goals of the study was to differentiate between, between the genders as far as the presence of BAT. Okay? And these are the study findings, but let's kind of look into how we got to these findings, okay? So in these first two slides here, we see adipose tissue where BAT is kind of obvious, okay? But also where BAT is even more obvious because we're staining for UCP1, okay? So if we stain for un uncoupling protein 1, that's a way of indicating that we found uh, brown adipose tissue. Okay. especially if it looks like brown adipose tissue. And also using a, a PET scan, a CT scan, or a combined PET and CT, we're going to see larger regions of adipose tissue, like I keep saying, in these upper cervical, kind of upper cervical, um, sorry, upper cervical and upper clavicular regions. Okay, so that's as far as where it tends to be lo located. Okay. Um, one of the things that this study found is that in the sample they used, um, they found a significant difference between BAT in women compared to men. Women tended to have more BAT than men. Um, we also saw higher mass, and we also found the activity of brown adipose tissue was higher in women than in men. What's also interesting is that they found an inverse correlation between the amount of adipose, of brown adipose tissue activity and the external temperature. So like I mentioned earlier, brown adipose tissue can be, uh, its activity can be stimulated by cold exposure. Okay, that said, we're not going to stick people in a cold environment just to give them more bat activity, okay? But if we look at mean outdoor temperature, the lower the temperature is outside, and this is from Boston actually, we see the higher activity of bat. And this is more, even more correlated, it seems to be in women, that activity of bat goes up more significantly, according to this study, when uh, outdoor mean temperatures are much lower, okay?
We also see an inverse correlation between um, detectable BAT and age. So BAT tends to go down at higher ages, so it seems to be more active and present at um, kind of adult, younger adult ages. And we also see an inverse correlation between the amount of BAT and body mass index, which is not surprising. So the higher body mass index that someone has, lower amount of BAT that they have, and it's like, could be a chicken or the egg thing. Is it because they have lower amounts of BAT that they have a high, higher body mass index? Or is there something about having higher amounts of adiposity that maybe displaces BAT or that promotes just lower amounts of it? Another thing we found is that higher amounts of BAT are inversely correlated with glucose levels. Okay, so we believe that brown adipose tissue is better at getting glucose out of the blood, which is something really important for lowering the risk of type 2 diabetes. Okay, so that sounds really good <laughs> so far. It sounds really good, but we need to be careful because we don't have that much of it. And when we first started learning about BAT, everyone was like, this is the solution to obesity. We just got to pump people up full of BAT. And we're not there yet, obviously. And again, like we keep talking with obesity is that there's, there, there's more than one thing going on and there's no like magic solution for it. But... Uh, BAT is a promising area of research, and it's a really interesting one of research as well. Okay, so this slide just kind of summarizes what I pointed out on the last slides. Okay, this slide also shows that in leaner individuals, so this is from a leaner individual up top, compared to individuals with obesity, we tend to see higher amounts of BAT activity, at lower levels of adiposity, which we talked about in the last section. And we also see higher amounts of bad activity with cold exposure. Okay, so B and D are cold exposure, and we see higher amounts of that activity with that, which I've kind of said a few times. Okay, as far as where bad is coming from, I like kind of alluded to this earlier, we're still kind of unclear about where bad develops from. And it's, we used to believe that brown adipocytes developed from a shared precursor of skeletal muscle that expresses something called MYF5, um, which would explain, if it's developing from the same precursors of skeletal muscle, like I said earlier, it would explain why it has more mitochondria, why it's more metabolically active as well. Okay. Conversely, white adipose tissue typically develops from um, cells or precursors that don't express that particular factor. Okay. That said, what's interesting, and we're going to get to this when we talk about beige adipose tissue in the next module, some BAT also seems to develop from these negative uh, MYF5 negative precursors, not the skeletal muscle precursors that most BAT develops from. And we believe this is an entirely different type of adipose tissue, which is similar, but but develops differently, something called beige adipose tissue. And we'll learn in the next section that beige adipose tissue is brown adipose tissue that developed from white adipose tissue, it beiged. 